Unseen World of the Bible, Session 12, The Cloud Rider. Now, I have some objectives for this morning. The first is to identify true and false cloud riders. Secondly, we shall be able to explain why Jesus called himself the Son of Man. I was listening to a debate between a Muslim and a former Muslim. And the Muslim was explaining that the title Son of God proves nothing because even other creatures were called sons of God. And the former Muslim, he replied, but he also called himself the Son of Man. And that proves his divinity. Of course, he had to go on to explain. Thirdly, I hope that we will understand the limited authority of the fallen gods why they're no longer as strong as they once were. And lastly, to affirm everlasting salvation through loyal faith in Jesus. Remember, you can download the uh, document in the PowerPoint slides from the site. Does loyal have a uh, time to it? Loyal? Yes. A time? Yeah. Yeah, don't stop. So it's everlasting. That's what makes faith everlasting. So you remain loyal to him, and he remains loyal to you. One of the themes of this chapter, then, what evil misperceived as the moment of triumph turned out to be its own defeat. The evil spirits who sought to crucify the Messiah. And then that salvation is about believing loyalty, trusting what Jesus did to defeat Satan's claim, that is his claim on us, and turning from all other gods and the belief systems of which they are a part. Yes? I thought maybe there was a typo in that, that loyalty should have not had the T. Salvation is believing loyalty. Leave out the T. You could do it either way. Yeah, they're both grammatically true. All right, major false gods of the Old Testament. This was not in the chapter, but it gives meaning to where we're going with these themes. Seven in particular, there was the Ashtoreth, or sometimes called Astarte, the Canaanite goddess of fertility, and a consort of Baal, female gods, who were not always nice. Baal, sometimes called Bel, or Baal, the Canaanite god of the weather, and of storms, and rain, and the fertility of crops. He is Yahweh's main nemesis in Israel. He is the God who gave Yahweh the most trouble. And Chemosh, the national god of the Moabites, Dagon, the god of the Philistines, Marduk, the Babylonian god of fertility, who has many names, and sometimes himself was called Baal, Milcom, the national god of the Ammonites, and Moloch, the Canaanite god. So, though some scholars think, well, that was not really a god, that was a sacrificial practice. And so there was even in the valley beside Jerusalem for a time, a sacrificial site for the offering up of, young, of, of little children. Slay your child, get some benefit from the gods. Now, I took a course in Ugaritic language some years ago, half a century ago, and there we were introduced to these recently discovered cuneiform tablets, some inscribed in clay, others in stone. And as scholars figured out what they said, one of the accounts that has now been translated was called the Baal Cycle, or the story of the god of Baal. We were provided the cuneiform rubbings, and so as students, we were sitting there identifying the letters, putting the words together, and then translating the story. All right. Anyway, here's one of the texts that we were translating one day in class. What enemy stood up to Baal? What rival to the rider of clouds? A god named Baal who rides on clouds. That's cool. Uh, what keeps him from falling through? Well. He's up there giving us the ring. Here we are, we're, we're taking these cuneiform letters, transcribing them into Hebrew, and then from Hebrew into uh, Roman letters, 
and we find out that this guy is called Raki Urpati, writer of clouds. Then the prof said, all right, now open your Hebrew Bible to Psalm 68, verse 4, or in English, verse 5, which reads, extol him who rides on the clouds. His name is Yahweh. Now, what was the date when the Baal account was inscribed? Well, by the 11th century, Ugarit had disappeared. And so these stories came from hundreds of years before the time of David when he wrote that psalm. And so this concept, the story of the cloud rider, the God who gives us rain to grow our crops and our food, that's Baal. But the psalm declares, oh, yeah, let's extol the one who rides on the clouds, but, but what? It's not Baal. It's Yahweh, the guide of the Lord of the Bible. So we get out the Hebrew Bible. We find out that the text reads, which is pretty similar. So when you reduce that down to the Roman letters, it's almost identical. In fact, it is identical, except for a B that is stuck between them, and the letter P on the Ugaritic side becomes a B on the Hebrew side. And if you think about it, P and B, they're almost the same letter, almost the same sound. So with that PB interchange between the two languages, we have an identical phrase. Although the, um, the Hebrew has a preposition in there on the clouds. This was a theme then in the ancient Middle East, in their mythology and part of the battle between the gods. Who is the true God? Who is the rider on the cloud? Who is it to whom we should pray for our food and the rain that brings it? Well, in the 15th century BCE, if we take the conservative date for the writing of the Pentateuch, there is no one like the God of Jeshurun who rides across the heavens to help you and on the clouds in his majesty. Jeshurun, remember, was an affective synonym for Jacob or for Israel. So Israel will live in safety. Jacob will dwell secure in the land of Ukraine, and we want for the heavens drop dew. Okay, so you get the connection then between the rider on the clouds and precipitation on the earth. Uh, Jennifer and I lived in a country once where the rains were very seasonal, and one year they didn't come, and that was a disaster. A people saved by Yahweh, not by Baal. Well then, let's go to the 10th century, and we have other scriptures now in the Psalms. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to Adonai, to him who rides across the highest heavens, the ancient heavens who thunders with mighty voice. We don't know how much of it was pure poetry, and whether some folk imagine that Yahweh actually does ride around in a chariot above the clouds, but we are to sing to him. But here he is called Adonai. Who is Adonai? That's also the God of Israel. It's also a plural, and it means lords. But it's such a great lord that he put it in the plural. And then Psalm 104. The Lord makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. All right, now he's using the name Yahweh again to demonstrate that he's the one who rides and comes and goes on clouds. Now we're making a big issue of the, the cloud rider for a very specific reason, which we'll come to. But at this point, we want to realize that the cloud rider is Yahweh, the true God of Israel. He's not to be identified with anyone else, no other God, and certainly no human being. Well, let's come back now to the Son of Man. And who and what was the Son of Man to be and to do? Now, it seems like a sudden change of subject, but this brings us right back around again to the cloud rider. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven, churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. Well, here we have the, the atmosphere is in action again. 
stirring up the great waves of the sea, but now beasts come up out of the sea. Now, does that sound like anything else you've read in, in the Bible? Revelation. The whole book of Revelation talks about beasts coming out of the sea. And in chapter 2, Daniel had talked about some great nations that were going to arise. And, the great, and now it's a, the vision of beasts. But the scripture does not leave us wondering what they are. And you've studied the book of Daniel enough to know that he was talking about five great empires. First of one of which was the Babylonian Empire, which uh, endured for some 1,200 years, which was then superseded, actually invaded, conquered by the Persian Empire. Of course, Babylonia today is largely covered by Iraq and Persia by <coughs> Iran. The Persians are eventually defeated by the Greeks. And the Grecian Empire continued from about 323 with the conquests of Alexander until about 31 BC. What happened in 31 BC? The Romans defeated Greece and began occupying the Grecian uh, colonies, including the Holy Land. But then the Grecian Empire was as we just mentioned, displaced by the Roman Empire, although the Roman Empire adopted the Greek language and the Greek culture so that the colonies would not be disrupted too much. They could continue on with their Grecian way of life, what we call Hellenistic culture. So how come the difference between the 31 BCE and the 509? You have the organization of the Italian states and that Roman Empire actually continued up until the 15th century of our era. But then all of these beasts were eventually to give away to an everlasting kingdom, which I'm going to suggest here began in 33 AD and continues to this time and will continue forever. However, as Daniel continues with his account, thrones are set up in heaven. As I looked at thrones, where sat in place uh, and in ancient days took his seat. Right. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all wood. Uh, who do you think this might be? That is Yahweh himself, and we know that from the book of Ezekiel, where the throne is described, and the wheels, and the flaming fire. Uh, remember Daniel, he is not written in Hebrew, it's written in Aramaic. And so it uses Aramaic terms, Aramaic expressions, and this term, the ancient of days, in Semitic languages, when you use an adjective of a noun with no qualifications, it normally has a superlative meaning. So when your Muslim friends shout, Allahu Akbar, they're just saying God is great. The meaning is, he's the greatest. And so the most ancient one counted in time takes his seat in a throne up in, apparently, in the heavens someplace. Well, what is, what's going on here? What are they doing? Well, first, Ancient of Days. This is the eternal God measured in time. And as Ezekiel said, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. What was the relation between Daniel and Ezekiel? They were both prophets of the exile. And they may have known each other and used each other's expressions, or Daniel would definitely refer to Ezekiel, perhaps. But the story continues. There's a divine human cloud rider who appears. In my vision, at night I looked, and there before me was one of the sons of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He's approached the ancients of days and was led into the presence. Is there anything startling about this? If you think in terms of well, where this took place, who were these beings in that place? In other words, this is Yahweh, surrounded by tens of thousands of angelic beings. What is anyone who looks like a human being doing in that place? Well, it's a vision, of course. A vision, of, uh, apparently, of some future time. 
we have a description then of a human being who arrives in the court of Yahweh in the heavens, and he is brought into the presence of Yahweh. Like the son of man, Ketbach Anash, that word Ket, that's what's translated like. It's a particle that can mean as, similar, in the manner of, after the appearance of many translations that are possible. And to say it was like a son of man in English kind of sounds as though maybe what? Maybe he isn't. But in these languages, this means he is. In other words, whatever a human being is like, he was that. And Jesus then would later apply this title to himself. So when he said the Son of Man came not to seek his own, I mean, came to give himself as a ransom for many, this is what he was referring to. And so the clouds of heaven, again, we have a divine cloud rider. And what is to happen to this human being? He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So how long would his kingdom last? Forever. Forever and ever and ever. And uh, how much uh, power will he be given? Over all nations and peoples, every language would worship him. So this is a human being then who is to receive uh, divine-like powers over all the nations. So he's called everlasting. I'm going to suggest that Jesus has begun to reign over those who obey him now, and he will one day extend his reign over everyone, everywhere. But we may have to yet prove the thesis. Uh, furthermore, in the 8th century, there is uh, Isaiah the prophet. He wrote this. The Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt with fear. And eventually, the majority of Egypt actually became Christian and worshipped the Lord Jesus Christ until the Arab invasions. Jesus identifies himself with the Son of Man, or as the Son of Man. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? So what was the significance of Caesarea Philippi? That was the foot of Mount Hermon. Uh, this was a, the, the rock upon which the Lord would begin raising up his church, not as its basement, but crushing it. Who do people say the Son of Man is? The reply, the question was, who is the Son of Man? And his disciples, they were thinking about it. Well, some say Jeremiah or Elijah, maybe one of the prophets so will come back someday. They hadn't figured it out yet who the Son of Man is would be. But they did know the prophecy. So Jesus changed the question a bit. Well, who do you say I am? He was hoping they would reply, the Son of Man. But Peter replies, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Well, was that true? Yeah, that was true too. So Jesus is going to put the Son of Man on the back burner for a while. So although we know that Jesus is both Son of God, that is the Messiah, and he is the Son of Man, that future human guy, how did Jews understand these two titles? Well, we just saw one of them. Messiah was to be king of restored Israel. And that's what the disciples, for the most part, were still looking for. They were not this point looking for the other guy. So we'll leave it as a query for now. Who or what was the Son of Man to be and to do? Well, we know about the receive a kingdom part, but there was more. Anyway, after the disciples confessed Jesus as Messiah, saw him transfigured up on the mountain, the Lord, in effect, had punched the devil in the eye, got his attention, trying to provoke the demon spirits to cause his death, which would, of course, be their undoing. 
From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. He starts telling them the gospel, which was going to happen very shortly, and he made it clear that it is I, myself, I am the one who is to be crucified and risen, even though they hadn't fig figured out yet that he meant that quite literally. So, after signaling to the spirits that he was about to reveal his glory and begin reclaiming the nations, how would Jesus ensure that human authorities would put him to death publicly? Blasphemy. Ah, if we could get Jesus to blaspheme, then they would do that. Hmm, would he ever do such a thing? Well... Very shortly thereafter, Jesus confesses before the high priest of Israel. So, it starts. The high priest said to Jesus, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. So, they're still stuck on the Messiah question. Is he the Messiah? Well, yes, but there's more. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Right. You know, in a legal court, you never want anybody to have an opportunity to say something that you don't want the court to hear. <laughs> but when the question is posed, are you the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus, in effect, said, you just said so. We'll just let it stand. You said it, it's now before the court. But I say unto you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. Translation problem. You will see. Whom was he talking to? Speaking with a high priest, but he used the plural pronoun you. In other words, you, Israel. From now on, you will see the Son of Man. Well, how will they see him? Well, his glory, his authority, the starting of his kingdom, which actually will wipe the temple right off the temple mount. This will be now attributable to, he says here, the Son of Man. So what's Jesus claiming to be? I am the Son of, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of Man. I'm taking my seat at the right hand of the Mighty One, and you will see me coming on the clouds of heaven. This is the part that they will see. The unbelievers won't see the rest directly, but those still alive at his return, they will see him coming on the clouds of heaven. He's the cloud rider. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. He is worthy of death. So there it is. The accusation of blasphemy. And the others replied, he is worthy of death. And so then they undertook to conspire with the Romans to have him tried publicly and to be crucified. So Jesus doesn't have much time now. Right towards the end, while he still had access to his disciples, he began to explain more precisely. As you know, the Passover is two days away and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Who would have thought so? So what Jesus does, doing now, he's, he's providing new information, but it's not, shouldn't be entirely unexpected since the Messiah was to be crucified, Jesus himself was to be crucified, now equating himself with the Son of Man, he can logically affirm the Son of Man is to be handed over and crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Capai, uh, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. And in fact, we know that they succeeded in doing so. But he was to be not only crucified, but then he was to rise back to life. Therefore, the spiritual beings who were our enemies who have sought from the time of Eden to gain rulership over the earth. And Yahweh himself had, in fact, for a time, 
given the rule over the Gentile nations to divine beings, most of whom apparently were not equal to the task. But now with Jesus crucified for our sins and risen from death, Paul can exclaim, He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. For he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So by the cross, not only do we receive our forgiveness of sins, but he triumphs over the demon spirits by the same event, because they no longer have any claim over us. Now that we are forgiven and have received everlasting life, we're no longer under their domain. We are now in the kingdom of the Son of God. And as Ephesians says, he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, spiritual power and political power alike. So the kingdom has come. The Son of Man has been crucified and risen. He has received his rule over all the nations, yet to be worked out, of course, politically. So why does this matter? You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Some of you were fortunate enough to be converted as children. Some of us somehow slipped out of that and didn't encounter Christ until we were adults. And so we have more to regret and to come to realize through repentance how much we had been ruled by spirits beyond our own. And that what interested us was the, the world system. It's, its wealth, its political power, its opportunities, its pleasures, its uh, financial advantages, and not realizing that we were being ruled by spirits greater than ourselves. So God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What can we now know about our living, loving God that otherwise could never have been known? And that's the grace of God his love for those who had rebelled against him. So what does God require of us, we who are now the chosen, who have been brought into Christ? For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith. And it is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So what did you and I do to deserve salvation? Nothing. Nothing. So like the way our, the author of our book puts it, we did not earn everlasting life by good performance. And we cannot lose it by poor performance. What does he require of us? God requires of us nothing more than our loyal faith in Jesus Christ. He has taken care of the sin problem. He has taken care of the problem of death. How can human beings be brought back to life in order to enjoy the Edenic new creation that he is going to bring about, that he might dwell in a huge family of both spirit beings and human beings. So, how did he depart from us? In what manner? He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud came from their side. All right, there are those clouds again. <laughs> the clouds are gathering. He rises up uh, into them. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way or manner you have seen him go into heaven. That is, 
in the clouds. So Jesus will one day come for us riding on the clouds. And this is what Jesus himself told his followers regarding his own coming return. Immediately after the distress of those days, all the people of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. This term distress in the older Bibles was called tribulation. Tribulation Jesus was talking about, I think, meant the seven years of the Jew, first Jewish revolt. And after the, that was finished, the next thing that, that believers were to look for would be the coming of the Son of Man, which we now understand to be the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You don't think we're having tribulation right now? No, I don't. We drove here today in automobiles with the heat on. No one was shooting at us. Yeah, we come to a nice warm place. There are no police outside to, to arrest us. Now, are there difficulties going on in the world today? Yeah, if you're a Russian between the ages of 18 and 35, you're probably not going to live much longer. You're probably going to bleed out in a muddy field someplace. Yeah, that, that's pretty bad. The United States is not currently under any kind of tribulation. And then we have the book of Revelation. I looked and there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. Where have we heard that before? Like a son of man. Daniel. This is Daniel. American evangelicals, they go through the book of Revelation looking for the rapture and they never find it because they're looking for Paul's vocabulary. But John did not speak in the vocabulary of the apostle Paul. John preferred to speak in the language of scripture and in the words of Jesus. But now the Son of Man has a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel, now the Son of Man is not an angel, the previous angel had already been mentioned, came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him, who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Now there's some problems with this text, at least some questions about it. If this is really the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, why would he have to wait until some angel came and told him it was time to start? What did Jesus say about his own knowledge of the end time? Only, his Father knows. Only the Father in heaven knows. And so even as the risen Messiah and the risen Son of Man, he's waiting for the signal from the heaven in which he, he's ready. He's, he's ready. And this is why he called the end time a harvest. Now, oh, that's my take on the passage. You don't have to believe it. Um, anyone, who were the true and false cloud riders? Yahweh is the truth. Okay. Someone else, who was the false cloud rider? Oh, okay. And why did Jesus call himself the Son of Man? Was it just the obvious? Hey, I'm a human being. To affirm his identity with Yahweh, and for those who are familiar with the, the verbiage of Daniel 7. Right? All right. And in what way has the authority of the fallen gods now been limited? Remember, they used to have authority over everyone. We Gentiles, we now come into eternal life. The spirit beings no longer have any authority over us. We have nothing to worry about from them. Their claim on all human beings to bring us through death into the underworld where they will rule, we no longer have any threat or worry. And then what must we do to earn everlasting life? He is the reigning king. We are loyal to him. Okay, the assignment for next week, read the Bible, look for spiritual stuff, get into verse 13, the great reversal in the book, and come ready with your questions, observations, and objections.